definitely appear to have sufficient speech that is uh, for functional communication. So, what are some possible diagnoses that might come through the mind? That you might need to think about in the center of the session. So, I know you kind of range from the next, I'll go to practice speech, okay, somebody comes to speech. What might lead you to that? As you were talking, and you took multiple trials to get the question. Okay, for example, you can do any other diagnoses that you might just want to think about or think you're, that are just kind of roaming around in your head? And you, uh-huh. Excessive insisting. Okay. Sure. Anything else? Okay. So we can learn you have a hard time sitting in place. So in the um in the background information, we learned also that you have a sister. The sister has a learning disability. Is that relevant? Why? One person. Why? Why is it relevant? Raise your hand. your general muscle. Yes. What often runs in families? Learning disabilities. Yes, like learning disabilities and speech and language communication disorders can run in families. So it is important to know that the sister has um, this diagnosis. Okay, um, so a couple of behavioral observations on HA. So throughout the day, he displays self-stimulatory behavior in the form of rocking and hand flapping. Overall, his mother and teacher describe him as being fairly compliant. When people do not understand AJ, he can get frustrated, leading to a minor tantrum characterized by hand flailing, whining, feet stomping, high-pitched screeching, vocalizations with protesting intonation. He enjoys doing things for himself, but he can get very frustrated when he's unable to do certain things, for example, complete puzzles. So given like the behavioral description that I gave you on AJ, does, do his behaviors surprise you in any way? No? Why not? Is this what you would expect? Yes. Why? <clears throat> yes. Because he has trouble communicating, so his behaviors are serving a cognitive function that he is able to. Are you able to I can hear you. Okay. So I, I think the behaviors are serving a communication function. So Which behavior? Because he's doing a lot. Um, sitting when he is not understood, when he gets frustrated, so he gets used to. Other inappropriate social behaviors and excessive foot screaming and screeching. Um, that might call attention. Okay, so you're saying that some of these behaviors are maybe because he can't communicate right now, right? He doesn't really have functional speech. Anything else about the behaviors? So, you know, he's got a diagnosis of autism, right? Okay. Well, like the whole <laughs> flapping and rocking usually are typical. So that's a behavior that you would you would expect, right? Mm -hmm. And certainly the fact that he's like you know like you pointed out like he's screeching, he's stomping, he's reaching for things. Remember, he it's really hard to understand, right? He he is understood really like only like a listener in you know, context. So only in certain situations. Outside of that, he's experiencing a lot of frustration, right? And even when he's talking. Can we understand? Do you think somebody else would be able to understand him? Likely not, right? So it is not uncommon. In this case, this little boy is autistic, right? And he's got other things going on. But it is not uncommon that a child that has difficulty communicating and expressing himself would act out. I don't know, like some of you maybe have been in like early intervention clinics. Perhaps, yes. And do you like so you're seeing clients there that are under three, right? Are they talking? Probably not. That's why they're in the clinic, right? But but if they're not talking, what are they doing? How are they communicating? Okay, they're pointing, they're gesturing, maybe they're crying, right? 
Maybe they're just reaching and grabbing whatever they want. Or hitting, right? Again, like why? They're not able to communicate that, right? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, at the beginning, we kind of talked about, about a couple of different diagnoses and they were thrown out. Is there anything now that maybe makes you say like, yes, I do think that that's the case. No, I'm gonna throw that one out. <laughs> well, what about Willie Prater's syndrome? Because he doesn't like running and he's also, that also aligns with a lot of autistic behaviors as well that are similar. Okay, so that's another, that, that's a good point. That's a diagnosis that should be considered. Do you think do you think he's a praxis still or not? Do you think there's enough information to know? What do you think? There's not enough information from said? No? I don't think so. I feel like I would be trying to be able to be able to be trying having so many trials to just be positive for it. You should look into that one. Okay, how would you look into that? <laughs> <laughs> Children that are um, maybe, let's just say, they're being considered as possibly having autism that frequently, you know, do, what do you know about their development when they're little? Does anybody know? Months, everything seems to be moving along. Normal milestones, you know, they have a resort sometimes. There's something that like, kind of stops, right? And that's the point a lot of times where mothers will come in and they say, I don't know, but like, it's not, and something is not right. And they can't quite put their finger on it. Okay. Um, so, um, so we, we know that he has autism, obviously, he has. A speech in Do we know how much he really understands? Yes, he can. Oh. He needs verbal He needs verbal and visual cues, right? Yes. The child had it in the catering test. We don't know that, right? No. And actually, thinking along like the in terms of like you're know, talking about an actual hearing screening, yes. right? Um, what if like what if like we know that like his hearing is okay? Oh. But no, no. I, I was throwing it out hypothetically. Let's just say, let's just say his hearing is okay. But what else would we want to consider going along with the hearing? CAPT. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of what I was thinking for this. <laughs> oh, we're talking just about hearing right now. Maybe like if there's a history of what? Hearing infection. Like hearing infection. Like infections. Like hearing infection. Because why would that be? Why would that even be important? Because it stops the hearing, and you're not getting consistent sound over a certain period of time to begin with. Right. See, so like that. Right. Maybe, maybe a lot of ear infections, which maybe he did or did not have. It's not stated. Right. Lack of incidental learning. Right. Or like you know, he has a lack of exposure. Good. Um, and then we know that he's restless, so we were thinking that possibly. Somebody threw out that like maybe there's like a, an attention deficit. We don't know. I mean, he's a little boy. He's seven. What would wouldn't you want to probably have a little more information in that regard, right? Because little boys are pretty restless, I think, right? Okay. 
Um, so where would you go? Um, what further information do you think you might want to know in regards to how you can express yourself, as well as maybe the comprehension? And who, or where would you go to get that information? Come on. Yes. Okay, yes. What do you have a question in mind that you might want to ask the her? Just, I mean, generally what we've already talked about, like the development of them and how he expresses himself. Like, I'm still being off the way different at home than they are. Okay, good point. Yes, the, the case file, case history file. Okay, if there's a case history file, uh huh. <laughs> Excuse me. Wouldn't you want to talk to the child psychologist that diagnosed him too to see if he's gonna get a diagnosis of attention deficit disorder? Yes, because we don't know. We don't know if he's got actually that diagnosis. It's something that they're playing games with. Maybe you might have it. So that's a good point. Yes. It sounds like he's not gonna be able to sit still for a formal language test. So oh. probably getting an informal language test within the naturalistic setting using probably like a book that you can identify like what words he's trying to produce and getting the recording as well. Okay, so you gave actually a really nice example of like you took into consideration that he likely is not a client that's going to sit for a standardized assessment, right? Because you gave a really nice example of a way that you could, um, you know, evaluate some of his knowledge. That's really good. Anybody else? Yes. Just always important to take into account that we never have one way of testing it, only form <laughs> reference and criterion reference. And from that whole picture, we develop, you know, the painting of what this child or this person potentially has been going through. And we pull from that, and then we can still tell the one to help and treat them. Good. I think you just really made one of your professors. <laughs> <laughs> Because what do we know about? <laughs> what what intake that he needs it? Oh, um, because he's kind of not walking very well. So he, right, so he's sort of awkward and clumsy, right? So yes. So you you would want to know about like if he's getting occupation therapy. What if you know he isn't? What would you <laughs> Okay, so make a referral, right? Make a referral based on your autism. So we've kind of really talked about this already, a little bit about how you might, um, different things you might do to assess the learning skills. Um, are there any, any thoughts on any other like informal ways you might seek to um, assess the skills? Somebody mentioned also getting information from the parent in terms of how he's doing, you know, at home. But there's another probably really good person that you should tap into. His teacher is very
For the following tests, I've highlighted anything that stood out as abnormal or outside the normal range by two standard deviations. So the last three tests. I continued with the SSW, the staggered spondaic war test. This has four conditions to it. The first is the right ear alone. So the right non-competing, that's what RNC stands for. So the word is like hot, and they have to say hot. But before they repeat that word back, at the same time, they're gonna hear a word in the right ear, that's the competing, and a word in the left ear, that's the competing. And then finally, they'll hear a fourth word in the left ear alone, and that's like ball. So hot, dog base, ball, and they have to repeat them all back. So in this case, he, in the competing conditions, he struggled. When the words were on their own, he did fine. Frequency pattern, this is a test of, um, it's how we relate to prosody in our everyday language. So some of the rhythm and sequencing of pitch and patterns, that's what we're looking at in this. They have to repeat back a pattern, so they hear beep, beep, boop. They have to say hi, hi, low, and so on. Um, abnormal in each year individually and collectively. Words and noise test, I'm looking at an actual signal to noise ratio. So now instead of just speech and noise that's static, I've got a fluctuating um, amount of noise and I'm changing that signal to noise ratio every four words. And I'm looking for this veteran's signal to noise ratio threshold. His was 9.2, that's significant, it's in the mild range. Anything uh, below 6.0 6 or below would be normal. So this is telling me, um, he told me he has difficulty in noise and this supports that support. Masking level difference, I will skip over, it was abnormal as <laughs> well. So I have had, I did a pretty comprehensive test battery in central auditory processing and the central auditory processing test was globally significant. So before we hit recommendations, we're gonna put a pin in it, and I did do a dizzy workup on them. So I did a vestibular evaluation, and I will scroll through, and you can see the highlighted yellows. I'll stop here. When he goes back, I saw a delayed, upbeating, the stagnus of the eyes that does not fatigue. As long as he looked up, his eyes beat upward involuntarily. That's a central finding. All the others were peripheral findings, specifically on the right side, which is where he had that right blast from the IED. So I'm seeing right periphery, and I'm seeing a central effect as well. Okay, so he has disabling tinnitus, he's in the tinnitus management class. He has CAPD-like findings. He has vestibular abnormalities. So I tell him about it. And in this case, when I told him that he has central auditory processing disorder or findings consistent with central auditory processing disorder, he was relieved. So he said, I knew something was wrong. I knew there was something going on. And one of the things that stands out to me most as a clinician, and that's worth taking what I, of the little time I have left in saying, is how many veterans or patients who, who have central auditory processing problems feel validated when they learn that there's an answer to why they're having the difficulty that they're having. So um, I can't just figure out what it is. I need to do something about it. And that's where some of the trouble comes in in our field. What am I going to do about this and how am I going to help? There's a couple different approaches. Um, we decided to land on our bottom up uh, approach. So enhance, enhancing our acoustic signal. So what we did is got him some hearing aids, hearing aids and a remote microphone system. And the reason why we will recommend hearing aids for somebody with normal hearing, if that's a question that you're thinking right now, it's a very good question. Why are you getting hearing aids for someone with normal hearing? Um, we don't know. This is the very good answer that I have. <laughs> no, um, we know that anecdotally, gosh, they report a good benefit. Our thought process behind it is perhaps if we can take some of the load off of plain old hearing, their brain is able to reallocate that 
effort towards processing. So hearing aids alone, in many cases, proves to be a big a game changer for this population. Now we add in a remote microphone to uh, enhance that signal to noise ratio, and we see a pretty significant improvement in their everyday function. And that's what that says. So with four to six dB of gain, he kind of had that wow effect um, when I put those hearing aids on him. He kind of watched the lights turn on, and it's pretty incredible with four dB of gain, which is very little. It's pretty much nothing. We talked about communication strategies and ways to improve the way he communicates because technology is not enough. We have to change the way we, we function with the people that matter to us. And we sent him to neurology. So neurology did a very comprehensive workup on him. I have it in there because I know the slides will be posted. I'm not a neurologist and I don't have intention of going through all of his neurology slides, but um, he does have, uh, he was referred out for um, obstructive sleep apnea or OSA evaluation and he has OSA. So sleep remedy is in place and migraine um, intervention is in place. ENT intended to do some imaging and then they forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's what's unfortunate. Um, okay, so um, lastly, we've completed his treatment and he reports um, at the end of his time with our DOM program that he's gotten a lot out of it. We would expect to hear that kind of either way. Um, he reports to us that the FM, the remote microphone was really helpful in his PTSD groups where he has a hard time hearing the groups collectively. And some last thoughts that I have is, he's an interesting case. He was complex. There's a lot more that there is behind the scenes in his evaluation, but he's a pretty standard case actually that we see. Um, so what I mean by that is the comorbidities of obstructive sleep apnea, depression and PTSD and migraine headaches, um, are pretty common comorbidities in the population with CAPD. We're doing some research and trying to figure out what might be a key factor that makes somebody more likely to have CAPD than not when they have all the same comorbidities. Um, we are presenting on that at NAVIS. Um, the NAVIS, are you guys familiar with the NAVIS um, North American Brain Injury Society um, in February? And lastly, we need more research in why we do what we do. Why am I putting hearing aids on normal hearing? And why am I getting remote microphones and all this technology? We need some more support, and that's something else that we'll be working on. Questions? I was just going to say, um, so you were talking about uh, that's specific to veterans with those comorbidities. Did you say, is, or is that to everybody with CAP that you're referring to? That's a really good question. Um, so the answer is in the veteran population. Okay. And most commonly, most the reason why is those comorbidities, depression, anxiety, PTSD, obstructive sleep, apnea, and migraine headaches are of the most common um, comorbidities in the TBI population that we see. So they're not as common out in the general population. The question. Yes. Not, it's a little side, <laughs> but um, I work with an 11 year old who was diagnosed with CAPD mm -hmm. in terms of dyslexia and other comorbidities. Mm -hmm. um, she, the audiologist, mm -hmm. had him see that. Is that something you're familiar with? I'm not familiar. It's a program where they oh. kind of try to remediate it. Yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. And then she completed the program. Mm -hmm. The right. mom had to purchase the program. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of money. Right. And moms, I'm not seeing any real difference from that in her language processing. Uh -huh. So I'm just wondering if there's anything like what so and mom looking at me now saying what do I do with now the CAPD? What? Yeah, there's a lot of auditory training programs that are out there. We kind of I brush through the top down versus bottom up approach. Um, so yeah, the limits to those programs are having a um, research that validates the outcomes that we want and. Unfortunately, a lot of time in intervention with CAPD, we are doing anything and everything we can think that might help, but we don't have a lot of good uh, data that tells us what to do about it. The reason I take a technology approach is because I know that signal to noise ratio is something I can decidedly manipulate and I can make an improvement. Whereas training programs are gonna be dependent on so many other factors, including just the validity or the efficacy of the program that's selected. So there's different schools of thoughts for intervention. I don't think that training programs are inappropriate. 
but I think that especially when a child who has stake in language and speech and language is involved, um, getting language and sound to the ears in the best and most effective way possible is really helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> she reported to her therapist that she had a, like severe head pain, headaches, and things like that. So the physical therapist decided it didn't sound so good. So she referred her back to her doctor, who then ordered a CT scan. And the results of the CT scan showed that she had a brain bleed. And because of that, she underwent a craniotomy with pretty good success. So one question for Tim that's okay. So my first question was, what is a craniotomy? But the answer is up there. So, um, so the craniotomy is really surgery to um, evacuate, basically, or drain whatever the the bleed or um, any other issues there. And it can be small or large, depending on the problem. And so they use it to treat um, brain tumors, hematomas or blood clots, aneurysms, ABMs, um, uh, atrial venous malformation, uh, traumatic brain injury, foreign object or bullets, anything that needs to be in the brain, swelling, things like that. So here's actually, for those of you who don't have never seen what happens with the craniotomy. So on the first um, one over here, um, that's the bleed, okay? So you can tell there's blood in the space where it does not belong. And what it's doing is you can see it's compressing down on the brain. And that's not good because the brain has nowhere else to go because there's the bony skull. So if you've got pressure compressing down, it starts, the only place that it can go is down. And what would that compress on if it's going down? The spinal cord, right. And you do not want that to happen. Um, so the second slide then shows what actually happens. So you can see that over here is the, the, the flap. So they first take the skin and they, and they move it out. And then over here is the bone. So then they drill away and they pull um, the bone out um, so that they can then go, and you can see he has a little tool and he's evacuating the hematoma right there. Um, in the past, with the, with the, um, the skull part, um, sometimes they're not able to put it back right away because it's a swelling, right? So you have to wait. So what do you do with that bony part? Because the bone is living. <laughs> yeah, so they put, yeah, you're right, they put it in like under the stomach. Now they have other 
of, you know, I think they have more advanced things and now they can put it in other places where it doesn't have to be, but they would put it under the skin and the stomach to keep it alive. Sometimes it worked really well, sometimes not so good. Um, but once the swelling is down, then they would put the bone back and then again, close off um, the area. So that's what a craniotomy looks like. So let's go on. So um, our patient, she was employed full time as an accountant prior to the surgery, and she had plans to return to work. She wasn't retired yet. Um, her job had responsibilities that were complex and stressful. Keep that in mind. Um, she lived with her husband, and she had two adult daughters who no longer lived at home. Um, and the craniotomy resulted in some cognitive impairment. Um, that ne negatively impacted her safety, her activities of daily living, return to work, social interaction. So question number two and the answers are there. <laughs> but what type of deficits do you think about when you think about cognitive impairments? Okay. Yeah, so memory, learning, reasoning, problem solving, executive function, what do you guys know about executive functions. What do I mean when I say executive functions? But what does that mean? What is a higher cognitive function? Okay. Problem solving. Sorry? Problem solving. Problem solving. Time management. Organization. Ah, thank you. Organization. Okay. Those are all executive functioning skills. Um, we have attention. We have awareness. And awareness can include awareness that you have actually any deficit. Some patients have no awareness at all. They think they're fine. They're obviously not. Um, so we talked about organization and then pragmatics and social um, cognition issues. So we look at our patient who was an accountant in, in a stressful <coughs> and complex job. And we've kind of looked at different things that could be affected in terms of cognition. So the third question is, how could these deficits affect her safety, her ADLs, her return to work? Yes. Maybe if she had a connection with another um, and had a specific um, type of version, like that goes with the client, she could forget something silly or okay. how to organize. Okay, think of what's the role of an accountant? Well, you're dealing with money, so if you're not paying attention to a lot of things or you're not aware of what you're doing, you could be giving somebody a million dollars instead of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and not necessarily just giving them, but what accountants work with? They work with like, yeah, spreadsheets and ledgers and accounting software, you know, debits and credits, all those kinds of things. So if you're not paying attention, if your organization skills are off, you enter a journal entry that's a debit rather than a credit, or vice versa, in somebody's account. That could be a real problem, okay? Um, what about her safety? How do some of these things affect safety? Maybe falling downstairs because you forgot what you were doing. <laughs> or attention. <laughs> like attention deficits, like you might you know, like, Okay. Things like walking the street, not noticing when the clock stops. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah.
initiation. That's sometimes big. A lot of times patients that have injuries to the frontal lobe have difficulty with initiating. Um, and so they may just not know how to get started. Usually once they get started, they're okay, but it's that whole thing that how do you initiate things? So that could be a problem. You know, you certainly want to look at receptive and expressive language. That's kind of the meat of what we do as speech pathologists and along with speech intelligibility and fluency. And so then how would you assess these areas in terms of formal measures and informal measures? So any thoughts? Do you guys know any formal cognitive measures? Okay, so I have the cognitive linguistic quick test. Oh wait, no, no, no. Sorry. No, I wasn't gonna pass around. I was gonna kind of show the different parts of the <laughs> hold on a second. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, let's see. I'm just kind of so the cognitive linguistic quick test. Um, so it has things like you guys can see this, right? So this is kind of like a cancellation task. So you tell the patient to look for a certain symbol and you give them a certain amount of time and they have to go through and then cross off all of those kinds of things. Um, so there are different tasks like that. There are orientation tasks. There's drawing a clock, which is always interesting. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, one, that's one test. What other tests do you guys know about? Huh? Mocha? Mocha? Okay. That's kind of like a, a quick one. Yeah. Mocha is used a lot of times in hospitals um, to get a quick uh, kind of assessment, um, which looks at orientation, the person, place, thing. Um, I think there's sequencing on it. Recall. Recall. Yeah. Some really basic things, but it's quick and easy to do. So in the hospital, when you don't have a lot of time with the patients, that's really something good. Anything else? The Woodcock Johnson, yeah, I like the Woodcock Johnson. Um, and there's different ones, um, but there's one that does look at cognition. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you can do something like that. Ask the husband how she's doing and then compare it to what you see with her. A um, couple of other ones. Um, so, um, so we talked about the Woodcock Johnson. Um, this is the River Mead. So the River Mead is interesting. It's really a behavioral memory test. So one of the thing, and they have you do a whole bunch of different kinds of things. But one of the things is you show the picture to the client, and then you say, um, "What I want you to do is to remember this person's name." Okay, her name is Catherine Taylor. You say, can you repeat that? Her name is? Uh, okay. Taylor. Now, later on, I'm going to ask you what her name is. And you put it down and you continue to go on with the test and then you come back to it and you ask and see if they remember, so. Um, there's the Detroit, one of my favorite tests. Um, Detroit, the Detroit Test of Learning Aptitude um, has a lot of nonverbal things. So if you have a client that's having difficulty with expressive and receptive language, um, some of the things here are quite easy. So these are shapes, you know, little uh, block shapes. And what they have is um, they have figures. And you have to kind of put the blocks into that shape. Um, so again, it's a nonverbal test. There's one where there are number patterns and there's a missing number, and the client has to figure out what that missing number is. Some of these are really hard, too. Um, they have these little blocks that they have to, you show them this for a certain amount of time, and then you take it away, and then they have to put the little blocks in this order. So there's a lot of different things that are nonverbal that can be done. Thank you. And then one last one to show you. This is the test of everyday attention. 
which is really an interesting kind of test. It has different things that you have the patients do. Some of it, it has reported. Um, and so it's kind of, it's elevator thing. So it's like you're in an elevator and then these numbers come and you have to remember the numbers and the sequences of things. It also has um, a huge map. And so you tell the patient, um, you show them, you want them to find these symbols on the map. And then you pull out the map, you give them a pen and you have them circle. You give them a minute to circle. And then after a minute, you give them a different color pen and have them keep circling. So a lot of different tasks to look at attention. And then in a lot of hospitals, um, because you don't really have a lot of time sometimes to do a formal test, those really take time, especially on the inpatient side, a lot of hospitals have like cognitive screening tests. So um, actually I can pass these around if you guys want to look at it. Some of them are really old, so. Um, here, so I'm gonna let you pass them out to different ones so they can take a look at it. Just make sure that I kind of get them back. Um, and, then, and then the other one that's up here is the RAY, Auditory Verbal Learning Test. And so this is a really interesting test. Um, it's a list of 15 words and you give them to the patient, okay? And then you ask them to repeat. And you go through this word list five times. Each time you ask them to repeat the words and how many they get. And then you give them a separate list of other words. And you have to repeat that. And then you go back and say, okay, well, Tell me what words you remember from the first list. Um, so are, what are they able to retain? How much are they able to retain? Um, and then the last one is you give them words and they have to identify was that a word on the list or not. So again, auditory verbal learning. There's some, um, these are kind of the fun tests, which are kind of like um, more neuropsych measures. But I don't know if you've ever heard of the Stroop test. Okay, some of those. So the Stroop test, this um, man named J. Roddy Stroop, he discovered this phenomenon in the 1930s. And so it's looking at selective attention or the ability to respond to certain environmental stimuli while ignoring others. So look at those, name the colors of the words, okay? Don't read the words, rather say the color of the words. For example, if the word blue is printed in a red color, you would say red, and you tell the patient to do that as fast as they can. Try it. Not as easy. It's a really concentrated to do that. So, but it's a good measure to see the flexibility of, of the patient, and can they actually do something like that? Um, another couple ones are serial sevens. So you, start, you tell them to start with that 100 and count backwards by sevens. This is the bad. Okay, again, that's a test of concentration. And so, and it's a time test. So you're, you're not only seeing how accurate they are, but how long it takes them to do that. Um, and then there are trail making tests. So um, I don't know if they still have them, but when I was a kid, they used to have these books where they were dot to dot. And you would remember the dots? Yeah, and they had numbers, exactly. So this is kind of the same idea. So in the first one um, over here, it's just basically simply one, two, three. So you have to draw lines, you know, in numerical order, one, two, three. So again, test of concentration, can they continue to do it? The next one, the other one, is more complex. So now you have to do 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, and keep going all that the way through. So that's a little bit more difficult, but kind of different ways. So there's a lot of different ways to look at um, assessment or evaluation for cognitive issues. And again, depending on what the symptoms that your client um, is having, then you would make the choices as to what kinds of measures you would look to use to find out what their skills are in that area. Um, so in terms of the results of the evaluation, um, so her attention um, to task was mildly impaired. She did show the ability to shift attention during task, but it was moderately impaired. So she could do it, but she was having some difficulty with it. 
In terms of orientation, she was able to answer personal and relevant questions with about 100% accuracy. So she was oriented. She knew who she was. She knew all those things about herself and her environment. In terms of executive functioning, um, she was having moderate difficulty with sequencing, which could be an issue for an accountant, um, with looking ahead, with initiation, with planning, um, and abstract thinking. So think about her job and her daily life and some of these deficits that she's having. Um, in terms of memory, she was able to recall general information that was presented to her without difficulty, um, but she had moderate difficulty providing details on an event that happened in the past. So some of her immediate memory was okay, maybe holding on to things was more difficult. In terms of her language, receptively, there weren't any deficits noted. She was able to follow conversation and respond appropriately to questioning. And expressively, she was able to maintain conversation, but with some mild impairments, she would sometimes forget that she had told a story or provided events um, or provided certain information and would present it again. So, you know, kind of that going on. So a little bit of memory there. Um, in terms of that. And she had a mild decrease in responsive names. Okay, so if you ask her to name things, she would not get them all right. Her intelligibility and fluency was fine. There were no problems there. Um, so what would be your clinical diagnosis as a speech pathologist um, for this client? You know, tell me the severity and what kinds of areas you would um, diagnose her with. Patient presents with a mild to moderate, mild to moderate. as characterized by sequencing, initiation, planning, action. Okay, good, good. Okay, so it's a long one, um, but those are kind of the issues though, that she's having there. And so what would be your recommendations for treatment? And think about things in terms of frequency and duration. So do you want to make the treatment as individualized as possible? So I would think to individualize it towards working, working towards going back to work. To work. Okay, so how many times are you going to see her a week? Okay, one to two times a week for how long? How long do you think the sessions are going to be? Okay. That'd be short. <laughs> well, depends. She's home now. If she was in the hospital, yeah. Yeah, but she's home now. Uh, so she's going to come see you as an outpatient. Okay. So actually, it's a tr somewhat of a a trick question uh, because frequency and duration sometimes matters by what the insurance will authorize. <laughs> so it's kind of somewhat of a trick question, but normally you would look at, depending, you know, if she's recently at home and she's having difficulty um, participating in the session, you know, you would gauge that. So you might want to start out with 30 minute sessions, maybe two to three times a week, and as she's able to tolerate more, maybe you could go 60 minutes, one to two times a week. So Kind of just depends. We'll take your cues from your client in, her, in terms of that. Um, and so then what areas would you focus on for your goals? Remembering of the cognitive skills that would be important for her as an accountant. Sequencing. Yeah. Sequencing, memory, attention. Exactly. Well, which ones? <laughs> Organization, I heard over here. Definitely organization. Planning. Problem solving, right? Sequencing, those kinds of things. Okay, so here's here's what her treatment plan and her progress was after three months post cranium. So the focus of goals, they looked at organization skills. So they worked on creating and keeping deadlines, setting and meeting goals making important decisions. Um, they worked on finances and budgeting, um, on managing her appointments and creating schedules. So those are all the things that they were working on in terms of her organization skills. Um, they worked on alternating attention. So shifting attention between tasks. 
by adding distracting stimuli. So that's what some of those tests would look at, okay? Can you do something with distracting stimuli? Because think about it, if you're in an office environment, especially if you're in kind of like an open office area where you have cubicles and, pay, and there are lots of people working and so you have the sound of phones ringing, you have the sound of people talking, you have all the other noise that goes on there. And so if, if you're not able to focus your attention and you're distracted by that, that can be real, really difficult for her to go back to work. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to give you the results of the organization skills. So she was begin after three months, she's beginning um, to be able to multitask and to think strategically, which obviously important skills for her to return to work. In terms of her alternating attention, she continues to present with some difficulties when shifting attention between tasks due to impulsivity, and she, she, she wants to be quick to make decisions, which is probably what she was like before. She could make quick decisions, but now it's not working out so well because she's skipping over important details. Because again, that attentional component, she's missing those things. Um, they worked on memory, and they looked at strategies for compensation. So initially, her husband was in charge of keeping track of the appointments, but now she's able to use a day planner, a calendar and reminders in her iPhone, um, and she carries a journal to be able to write important details that need to be remembered throughout the day. So that's how, those are the compensatory strategies um, that they taught, that she was taught. And then in terms of expression, uh, expressive language, maintaining appropriate conversation skills with a conversation partner, that's improved. Um, so she's now able to maintain um, the topic, um, initiate conversation, take turns, so that's all appropriate. So she's doing pretty well, three months post. She's still um, continued to do in therapy, um, continued to work in therapy. Um, and I want to leave you with some kind of treatment activities you know, so we looked at the goals. Um, so how do you work towards those goals? Um, so we talked a little bit about compensatory, compensatory strategies, daily planners, calendars, iPhone reminders, those kinds of things. So when a patient is having difficulty remembering, um, one of the best things to do is help them, hopefully they remember to use the strategies, but um, you give them some tangible kinds of things to do. Um, some patients, you know, now everybody has you know, iPhones, iPads, whatever, you can use those, but a lot of times they're, they're sometimes difficult to find everything, and if you have a, you, know, you have to remember um, your code to unlock it and all that. So sometimes just the, going back to the old-fashioned, you know, journal, day planner, or something like that is a little bit easier to start with. Um, in terms of working memory, they work with lists of numbers in random order, um, repeating things back in numerical order, those kinds of things. So um, remembering those kinds of things. Again, numbers are what she does. So having the ability to remember and use and, and all of that was really important for her. Um, in terms of visual recall, they had her recalling groups of three letters in three rows. So you show them for two seconds and take them away and let them remember, those kinds of things, both with and without distraction. Again, the space where she worked had a lot of distractions. So you, um, a lot of times we forget, um, and we're working with our clients in a nice office, you know, that's very quiet and all of that. And we think the client is doing great. And then you hear from the family, you know, they're still having difficulty. And you're thinking, oh, why is that? Because we, you know, it's a nice, you know, environment where we're in, but when you take them out and you add all of the other things of distractions and things going on, it becomes more difficult. So one of the things that's really important to keep in mind, um, if possible, is to take your patients out into the community um, and see what, how they're functioning in the community, because that's really important information for you to gain. Even when you have patients in the hospital, I used to take my patients down to the gift shop. And we, you know, we make a list and say, well, we're going to go to the gift shop to get this. And, you know, either if it was money we were dealing with or they had to remember what the items were, we go down to the hospital cafeteria and do those kinds of things. So as many things as you could do to get an idea. And when they're outpatients, you can meet them sometimes, some way. Um, meet them at the bank 
um, you know, sometimes you go to a restaurant and do those kinds of things. Um, in terms of word fluency, they had their name words in, con um, in concrete and abstract categories. So types of fruits, how many fruits can you name in a minute? Or words that start with B, how many words that start with B? Okay, and you work up to that. Um, and finally, some attention tasks where they should circle or underline specific. Okay, are there any last minute questions for any of the speakers? Okay, thank I'm you. That's a no. <laughs> um, okay, so huge thank you to our speakers. Um, Thank you for all of you coming. It's really great. Um, yeah, so our next event is Pediatric Care and Medical Setting, and that's in two weeks at 7 p.m. here. Um, our professor, Christine Cho, will be presenting. She's the director at Children's Hospital at LIT. So that'll be a great lecture to come to. Remember, it's $5 if you're not a member. Coming up. Oh, and on Halloween, the 31st, we're going to have a uh, food and snacks fundraiser. So come by and if you haven't gotten your merch yet, get it there. You can get some candy and just help support this organization. Have a good night, everyone.